Hi everyone, um, I want to welcome you all to this evening's event. Um, I am so glad that we're all here to um, be here this evening. Um, I would like to introduce Mark Lafferty who will be um, welcoming us all more to this event. Thank you all for being here. Thanks, Chloe. Good evening, everyone. I'm thrilled to welcome you to this evening's Business Technology Forum event, Women in Tech Closing the Gender Gap. I'm Mark Lafferty, Director of Federal Sales at CDW and co-chair of the Executives Club Business Technology Forum. We're excited to hear from our panelists about this timely topic. I am delighted to welcome our panelists, Waverly Deutsch, Adjunct Professor of Entrepreneurship, the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, and Shelby Flora, Managing Director, Accenture Security. Moderating today's program is Cecilia Myers, VP of Digital at CDW. We will have time for audience questions at the end of our program and encourage you to send them using the Q&A box. I know we are in for a great discussion with these panelists. Thanks again to all of you for joining us and thank you to our speakers for taking the time out of your day to share your insights with us. Cecilia, over to you. Thank you, Mark. So excited to talk to you both today. And so I'd love to kick it off by just learning a little bit more about you before we dive into the questions. So if each of you could tell me where you work slash kind of what do you do, as well as um, what does your organization kind of do or provide? Um, and, you know, kind of just give us a quick answer, a couple of minutes, and then we'll get right into the questions. And um, Shelby, let's go ahead and start with you. Yeah, thank you, Cecilia, and I'm excited to be here. Very uh, much a passion area of mine about getting diverse talent into more leadership roles in tech. So my particular role is I'm a managing director at Accenture, which is a very large consulting services, BPO, media services firm. Um, and in particular, I focus on cybersecurity. And within that, I wear a few leadership hats, including various technology implementations, but also doing the human side of security, which includes scaling behavioral analytics, et cetera. Great, thank you. And Waverly, please. Hello, everybody. I have been at the University of Chicago for the last 22 years teaching entrepreneurship, uh, all kinds of entrepreneurship, uh, but we do have a lot of tech entrepreneurship. I come out of the tech space. Uh, my very first um, entrepreneurial venture was uh, as employee number 27 at a company called Forrester Research, which was the company that told corporations they had to pay attention to the internet and we did the rocket ship thing. Uh, while I was there, we went from 20 people to 400 people. We had an IPO, 200 million in sales. Um, so that was a, a ride that really hooked me on tech growth companies. Thank you. So let's dive in then. Um, Waverly, I'll start with you, although this question is really for both of you, um, but let's start with, there's a lot of research that makes it clear that girls and young women do not feel drawn to STEM career paths or just kind of working in the field. And they feel like it may not align with their long-term goals. So we see the number of women in STEM, it's growing, but it's growing slowly, a lot slower than, than we would like. Um, and so I'd really like you to talk about um, how you believe schools, organizations, employers can spark and maintain the interest of school-age women. So because I work at a school, that is obviously something that that is really important to us. And we do entrepreneurship. It started at the business school, but we do it at all levels. So we do it at the mm -hmm. undergraduate level, as well as across okay. various graduate programs to engage more women. And one of the best ways for women to rise in tech is to start their own tech companies. And I think one of the issues around keeping women engaged is the popular media vision of the culture of tech. So you have movies and books and TV shows about Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg and um, Travis uh, Kalnick and, and they're jerks. And guys <laughs> see that and they want to be that, right? And then you have, you know, Melissa Mayer and Marissa Mayer and, you know, Cheryl, Cheryl uh, Sandberg and, um, Theranos just went out of my head, but, you know, and yep. don't want to be that. So I think one of the things that we have to do is always talk about and remember that the media perception is where it's newsworthy, that the mainstream and the average isn't newsworthy, and that that's not what's happening in the bulk of tech companies. 
Uh, and, and I think one of the issues for, for us as educators is to make sure that women see other kinds of role models than those who are presented in, you know, the media. Absolutely. And kind of, you know, moving from the school age view now into the into the track where they're professional, you know, kind of in the workplace. Shelby, tell tell me a little bit more about how do you think, you know, in your role, how do you try to encourage and spark and grow that through at, at all, all levels? Yeah, there, and there's very uh, similar themes from both the, the educational institutions into into corporate. So I absolutely agree with Waverly, like uh, real world role models are incredibly important. It reminds me of, um, who was that first gentleman that ran, Roger Bannister, who ran the four minute mile for the first time. There was all this hoopla back in the day that the four minute mile was just not possible. And so there's this kind of self-limiting belief. If you don't have an example of barriers being broken, those barriers are there for a reason. So I do think it is very important and incumbent upon organizations to provide visible role models of folks who've had alternative career paths or from alternative alternative backgrounds that are making it um, uh, in, in kind of their own way. And that visibility and the accessibility to those role models is incredibly important. I know um, at least at Accenture, it is, you know, if you are a managing director, it, it is one of your priorities that you have to be cultivating um, the younger generation, in particular in DI and B categories as well, to make sure that they're getting access to those role models. Um, additionally, I think it's quite important for institutions, particularly as we're trying to, to get, get towards a degree of equity, is you have to measure your progress. Um, and yes, this will be met with various degrees of resistance within and within corporate structures, but you have to know how well you are or are not doing. Do you need to add more mentoring to programs? Do you need to be, you know, recruiting from different places, et cetera. If you otherwise you're just throwing paint at the wall and hoping you're, you know, you're hitting hitting a bullseye. So I think tracking progress and figuring out the right metrics to to inform and give you those insights is also important. And then finally, I think it is incredibly important that when organizations are providing skilling opportunities, whether that is via kind of informal mentoring or direct mentoring or, or training is they are being, uh, women who are trying to make it to management positions are being mentored on the hard and the soft skills. I think there's this weird assumption that women need only mentoring on the soft skills to you know, be more confident in, in a boardroom, et cetera. I think that's a bit of a, a fallacy and it, it may be true, like as folks find their own version of assertive, but, you know, as folks are moving out of individual contributor roles, you have to know the tangential skills that why your skill makes or, or contributes value to your organization. So whether that is business acumen or if you're a developer, know, you know, the design process or how you bring you know, something to market, et cetera. I think it's incredibly important that those mentors and those teachers are providing hard skills and not in just into the, just the soft skills, which I think historically has been over indexed for. So it definitely sounds like that role, you know, that role model is key kind of in both worlds that you live in, um, as well as, of course, the mentorship. Um, I wonder, though, you know, Shelby, tell me a little bit more about um, some of the issues that you see women facing as they are trying to climb through the ranks and stay in the STEM field while doing so. Yeah, um, so I also come from a behavioral science background too. So one of the first things I always look about are, are there structural things or things in the environment that are prohibiting the right behavior, if you will, from being being displayed? Um, and from a corporate perspective, when you're looking at gender equity, you have to look at your programs and structures that you're offering to your workforce. So I'll just use a simple example of, of Accenture, and this, this is well known. Um, Julie Sweet is our CEO globally, um, but before that, she was our North America CEO. And I think it's within one year of her um, ascending to the North America CEO um, rank, we had our the uh, parental leave uh, got extended for both men and women. There was the ability, you know, because consultants tend to travel a bunch, there was the ability to ship breast milk back overnight um, as uh, for, for, uh, for new mothers. Additionally, you could elect to work in your local city for up to a year, et cetera. So Accenture was very purposeful about creating gender equity, not only programs, but support systems, because what we found in the data, this goes back to my earlier point, what we found in the data is we were pretty good at gender equity until you got to management level. And what we, when you, we dug into it is that kind of coincided with 
life planning decisions, we'll just say. And Accenture in the industry that it performs in traditionally dictated a certain lifestyle, which is traveling all the time. And so women were self-selecting themselves out because they didn't see how both could coexist. So by us being more flexible and offering programs that allowed both to coexist, we've been able to retain women at the manager and above level uh, much more successfully. That's great. Um, and it's really great to hear about how you're seeing that changes. You know, you had a, as a female, had a female leader take over as CEO, you're seeing that balance shift. That's exciting to hear. Um, we really tell me a little bit about the entrepreneurial space specifically. What, what do you see in, is as successful in supporting female entrepreneurs and who are founding and growing those companies and staying with those companies, particularly in STEM? Oh, I think you're muted. There are, there are some specific challenges that women face in trying to grow the big unicorn companies that everybody talks about. Um, there's a huge funding gap for women. So one of the things that we have to work on with women is getting them more access to capital. Um, there, there is a tendency by women, Shelby was talking about self-selecting out of careers where they expect you to be on the road 70, 80 hours a week, there is a tendency by women entrepreneurs to think about building businesses that they can execute without having to get a lot of help, right? So they tend to go into services businesses, retail businesses. When they look at tech and they see the funding gap, right, it can be very, very daunting. So, so that's certainly a very specific area for the women that I work with because they have the networks that they need to get over that capital burden, they just have to learn to ask. And so women don't always know that you're supposed to get out and ask, even though they're strangers. The way women approach asking for favors is they think, have I ever done this person a favor? Or can I see doing them a favor in the near future? And if they can't answer yes to one of those two questions, they don't think they're supposed to ask. Whereas men approach asking for favors by saying, I'm going to ask for this favor. And if the answer is no, that's fine. I'll go ask somebody else. And maybe someday down the line, I'll do that person a favor. So teaching women sort of how to think big on the one hand and say, you can model your business as a business that you can self-fund, but you can stretch that model to consider what would be possible if you brought in outside capital even from angel investors. And you can stretch that model to say, what would be possible if I brought in venture capital? And is that a business that you're interested in pursuing? And when you do that, women are like, yeah, yeah, I would wanna be able to do that. So then it's a case of, okay, let's make sure this business case fits the economic right. model of the, of the venture world and let's get you introduced into the venture world. The timing right now couldn't be better for women entrepreneurs. Get, put aside the momentary, are we in a recession? Aren't we in a recession? The VCs right. are slowing down. But up until five minutes ago, let's, you know, let's say, VCs have started to become very concerned about a lack of diversity in their portfolios. In Chicago, we have an initiative called Chicago Blend that is looking at diversity in the VC and tech particularly the tech startup world. So they're actively looking for more women who are you know, progressing in venture backable businesses and generating revenue. So when women are able to start thinking bigger and learning that you can ask strangers for favors, <laughs> right? That's what, we, that's what we really have to do to encourage more participation in the high growth tech sector of entrepreneurship because there's a ton of participation by women in entrepreneurship. About 41% of the entrepreneurs, um, the self-identified entrepreneurs in the economic studies were 41% were women in 2020. About a third of the entrepreneurs who asked for angel funding were women. So you know, back to what Shelby's talking about, that self-selection. And then as you go further and further down the funnel of BC, fewer and fewer women are asking. So that's really interesting. I. I um... You know, I, one of my questions, and you kind of answered it, was, has, have you watched this kind of change in venture? Are they beginning to really seek, um, you know, female founders, female founding teams? 
Um, I, I fundraised 10 years ago. It was, hmm. it was rough. I was a co I was a co-founding team of two women. Um, and it was, it was hard. Um, and, uh, that was, I'm really thrilled to hear that, 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 uh, the need for diversity has incented them to begin to look for alternative team structures. Let me put a caveat on that. Yeah, please. Right. Um, the amount of venture capital dollars going to women has hovered around two to 2.5 percent going to women only teams for decades. 2019 went up and then it started to come back down again in 2020, 2021. So when funding tightens up, the women are cut first. If you add a man to the team, you're still only at about 15 percent of companies. So about 80 to 85 percent of capital is going to all male teams. And that's been really steady. So we'll see an uptick in the number of deals done with women, but they raise less money than men. Interesting. Or we'll see an uptick of dollars going to women, and then the following year it'll come back down. So there's an, a, more of an awareness and more progress. What I would say is the way the venture capital world is working right now, they are skimming the cream of the crop the very top, top, top 1% of women entrepreneurs and putting all their money in, in those baskets. So there's data that says women are more efficient with venture and, and women you know, are more successful in building businesses and people are, are, are women better entrepreneurs. I don't think that's what the data is saying. I think what the data is saying is that we're only funding the very, very top most talented female yep. entrepreneurs. And so they're very, very successful. Whereas we're funding a much greater portion of the pyramid of male entrepreneurs. That's really interesting. And thank you for clarifying that. It, it also speaks to the potential for the rebalancing of the portfolio to raise the bar for everyone if you go less deep right on both sides and get the get the top percentage. Um, exactly. Of all, exactly. Right. Yep. <laughs> Um, no, thank you. Thank you for that perspective. Shelby, I want to turn to you about you talked a little bit about as a managing director your role in growing and identifying talent at a more junior level. I would love to hear a little bit more about how has your lens as a woman in tech informed how you're thinking about opening that leadership pipeline, pulling people in behind you. Um, it, what, how do you kind of think about um, meeting that goal, not just from an Accenture perspective, but also clearly it's, it's important and you're passionate about it for yourself. So how do you think yeah. about it? I think about it in two ways. And the first thing I will say is I was one of those people that didn't have a role model until about five years ago when we brought in um, a female managing director from industry. So here I was just trying to, to navigate the, the, the labyrinth that is, um, that is my firm without any sort of template to, to reference. And since having my uh, mentor, um, and it is, it, I will say the so there's that, that low grade anxiety of just because I'm thinking about things differently and managing my business differently, the affirmation that that's okay and that that's an acceptable path to, to making my team, my offering, my et cetera, the firm successful, that that, that has been um, really, really delightful in the last few years. I don't think I realized that until just this conversation, <laughs> that having that for me um, has been been such a treat. So when, for me, um, I'm actually super proud of my team. I have about a 60% uh, per, uh, diverse team, and I've been very intentional about that. Um, not only do I think is it the right thing to do, but quite frankly, being in cybersecurity, we are only a quarter of a step ahead of the bad guys and girls at any given time. And so the best way to, to, to put up defenses is to have very diverse ideas, which comes from diverse talent. So that is very uh, strategic in, in my regard. But for particularly for the women, I find myself having to repeat several coaching points um, based on some of the behaviors I see them, them exhibiting is, first of all, is I have to coach them to find their version of assertive. I never ask them to be a hardcore extrovert or be the person, you know, pounding on the chest, you know, in the boardroom or anything like that. Because I, I think if you're operating out of uh, integrity of yourself, that will make you ineffective. It'll make you do, you know, make poor decisions, be a bad leader, et cetera. But whatever they need to do to find their version of, ass uh, of assertive to be able to raise issues or advance causes, et cetera, they have to really tap into that. And there's various different ways and activities and stuff that you can go about exploring that for oneself. 
Additionally, another thing, and I kind of um, categorize this into two ways, is I call it the Tiffany Box Syndrome. Um, so for folks um, uh, that I find myself mentoring who are women, there's this propensity to not want to either put forward projects or innovations, et cetera, until everything's perfect, until they've solved for every single thing. And I always say progress over perfection, particularly in tech where the industry is moving eight with very quick releases, agile, et cetera, and time to market is in fact what the market values right now. <laughs> like the speed, speed is the number uh, one driver. And so this whole idea of everything has to be perfect is just, is just not suitable. Additionally, um, and then this kind of same vein is being able to make decisions in imperfect information. Mm -hmm. um, so particularly as folks get up into management level or, you know, offering management, you know, whether they're managing teams or, you know, uh, you know, revenue, et cetera. As a leader, you have to be able to make decisions with imperfect information, not, not any information. You definitely do need to have some insights. But once again, this propensity to want to have every nuance and every permutation and every model possible, that slows down a team and that slows down progress in that can ultimately impact our clients. Um, so I found myself doing a lot of coaching around that as well as women make their way up in, into leadership positions in my firm. And I, I like what you said there about finding their version of assertive, because I think so often um, women in technology, but in leadership positions in general, um, feel like they have to uh, put on the the cloak of male behavior to succeed in in a system designed you know classically for men to succeed in and, and you know it's it's just the way it often is and so saying you know hey I am giving you the advice to be yourself but also to find a way to stand for yourself um, that I think that that really resonates um, as great advice for for a diverse team in general, right? And like you, like you were noting, it holds true for anybody who um, is not maybe the the uh, the plurality of, of everybody in the room. Um, do you think that what you talked about, you know, the the uh, women, young women, or, or women in general, wanting to have everything kind of lined up and perfect before they put an idea forward? Do you also find that that gets in the way of them maybe going for management or leadership positions? Do they yeah. feel like they need to go after everything? And tell me a little bit more about that and how do you coach them in that area? It's funny, I have a, a perfect example. So we're going through our performance management season right now, actually at the firm and in prep for it, I always chat with all my folks that, you know, what's their assessment of the year? What are they looking to get out of, you know, these outcomes, et cetera. And there's a particular gal who's like, I, like, I think we should try for promotion. Like it's a, it's a little early, but like your trajectory is there and you have all the core fundamental re requirements, like let's go for it. And the response is like, no, I just feel like I need another lap to get, you know, this is just one more experience. And once again, not to be uh, biased on the inverse, like rarely does a dude say that <laughs> to be, to, to be a bit uh, colloquial, but the idea of stretching yourself with safely, once again, not putting our clients at risk or the firm at risk or their mental health at risk, but it's okay to, to kind of stretch yourself a little bit um, to, to take opportunities that you might not be qualified for, but you by all means have the competency and the skill and the experience to, to, to do the role. So that's, uh, so I proactively push people a little bit. Um, but I do find myself uh, having to also coach folks that it's okay to not be 110% prepared for role, but you know, 90% is okay, and they'll figure the rest out. Yeah, there's a, there's actually a lot of research on exactly that issue. Women won't apply for a job unless they have every you know yep. every requirement that, and, and and a guy will apply for a job if he if he just wants the job and will work to spin his background as is appropriate for for the job i think one of the things that that women have to understand is that if you're not hearing no then you're not pushing yourself right there, there is nothing wrong with asking for the promotion or applying for the job and not getting it and having the feedback you needed this this more experience this other experience the same thing with women going to a venture capitalist or going to an angel investor hearing no and being told this is what we look for in a business this is what it would be needed if you're not hearing no then it's hard to grow it's hard to learn and that that's something that we have to actually actively coach for women 
right? They can't wait until the answer is certain to be yes, because we learn from no. That's, that is, uh, I love that follow on to the learning from no is, is you, you don't get the feedback unless you ask. And yes, it's disappointing. That's, that's fair. I mean, everybody wants to get the yes, you're promoted. Congratulations. But um, you won't know the path there um, until you elicit it kind of forcefully, unless Shelby, you, you have someone, you know, like you as a boss, who's really dedicated and <laughs> you sound wonderful, like a wonderful coach. And most of us, unfortunately, are not um, lucky enough to have great coaches that often in our careers. You know, I can think of a few people where I was like, wow, I got, I was so lucky that that person coached me. Um, but a lot of times you're with somebody who you, you're going to have to push. Um, you're going to have to do a lot to kind of get, go forward. And I think it comes down to fundamental truth. And whenever I do find myself having to, to nudge or push folks is nine times out of 10, if you give people a stretch roll, they will rise to the occasion. So the odds are actually in your, and this is for men or women, but, and it's, you know, I remember learning this from one of my mentors, one of the senior managing directors here too. He's like, I always put people in stretch rolls because people will surprise you. Um, and so I, I try to give them anecdotes, et cetera, of, you know, where there have been successes that people have taken stretch rolls, but it's still, unfortunately, I do get a little bit of pushback that, um, that I hope eventually that goes away. I hope so too. Um, so let's talk, um, Waverly, I want to talk to you a little bit. We've been talking a lot about women as a group, but I'd love to hear a bit more about your research for issues that focus on the LGBT community in the business sector. Um, what do you see in the in the startup you know community there in terms of the barriers people face, the unique challenges, and what is your impression of how tech leaders can foster that true diversity? Shall you know exactly what you're talking about, Shelby? Um, what do you what do you think are what are tips that you think are important for leaders to know and work on? So when we talk about diversity, we as a society, we kind of started with gender. Why are there no women in the boardrooms? Mm -hmm. Then we started to look at diversity by ethnicity. Now we're starting to think about diversity much more holistically, right? So the younger generation is gonna force us to do this. An enormous percent of Gen Z wants to use the they program pro, uh, pronoun. And, mm -hmm. and they wanna do that because it's a political statement because it's a personal statement because it's it's important to them that they not be categorized. Um, you know, diversity isn't just color or gender; it's life experience. Do you have somebody who's come from a rural background versus an urban background, right? And it, it's interesting. Shelby started this conversation with getting involved in diversity. When you start working with women, then you start to realize that the issues that women face are very similar to the to the issues that um, other communities face. And LGBTQ community is a community close to my heart. Um, and one of the biggest issues for the LGBTQ community is how do you come out? How do you let somebody know? It's considered rude to ask someone's sexual orientation, whereas we think we're entitled to know their gender or their race, right? We think that's something we should just be able to know. Um, people misgender me and they get a little upset because I get it right. I'm tall, I have a deep voice and I have short hair. It's it's not a big deal. But for the, for the LGBTQ person who is trying to build a relationship with an investor, with a new employer, right? To not know how to deal with something that is very central to themselves, it, it, it's, it keeps a barrier from having a trusting relationship. And this is what we heard in the research, that particularly at the seed stage, you're working with these people in a really close way. You don't necessarily have to be great friends, but you need to be able to trust each other and to build that trust. And if you're not honest about who you are, as Shelby said, if you're not bringing your authentic self to the engagement, then the investor's thinking, what is this person holding back? Because there's something there that isn't clicking. And, you know, as a, a lesbian, I would say to people, doesn't offend me if you ask, right? So, you know, if you say, what did you do this weekend? We're, you know, instead of saying, you know, do you have a boyfriend? Say, 
Do you have a partner? What gender? Yep. You know, let it be sort of more normalized. And I think we're in a period where, you know, first it was, you came out, you were fired. Now it's, well, we don't want to, you know, put you, make you feel at risk, right? So there's this extreme pendulum. So now we have to get somewhere in the middle. I'll give you an example. The Chicago Blend Group that I talked about, that's looking at this specifically in Chicago, I, <coughs> at, at the Polsky <coughs> Center, we, we were their research partner. So I was reviewing their survey. I said, why are you not asking about LGBTQ diversity? And they said, well, we, we are we allowed to ask that question? And I said, all you have to do is, is ask how many self-identified LGBTQ entrepreneurs do you have in your portfolio? Not how many LGBTQ entrepreneurs do you have in your portfolio, how many self-identified? If you wanted to, to do a survey of your own organization, right? don't ask, are you LGBTQ? Because that puts the person who maybe isn't comfortable coming out, do I lie and say, no, I'm not? Do I say yes, but I'm not really comfortable coming out? Say, do you openly identify as? So, so let, just try to think about language that's more inclusive. Um, one of the challenges that women have, one of the challenges that African-Americans have, one of the challenges that Latinas have, that one, of the, one of the challenges that the LGBTQ entrepreneur has is that they have, ideas for businesses that serve their community. And they go to investors who are by and large, right? Cisgendered, white, straight males. And the guys say, well, I don't know anything about this market. So, right, one of the issues around diversity, I don't know anything about with the women's market. I have a, a company that's doing an innovation in period care. And the men are like, I don't know anything about this. But you know, let me ask my wife, which is a terrible, you know, default. So one of the issues is we have to have advisory boards and networks that allow us to do due diligence on markets that aren't directly our market. And when you realize that a meaningful percent of this country is LGBTQ, a meaningful percent of this country is African American, a meaningful percent of this country is Asian American, right? Then you realize that there's a reason to support businesses that serve those communities. And I think I think those are some of the, the critical issues for that community in particular. That's really helpful, is especially, you know, I, I kind of picking up on two really key themes where we need to invest. One is the the language of inclusivity. How do you just normalize talking about things and ask questions of people in a way that's just thoughtful of the things you don't know? You should yeah. not make assumptions, yeah. right? And leave room for people to tell you what they're comfortable about themselves to get to know them. Um, and, you know, obviously there's investment companies are making into things like, hey, Use your pronouns and your email signature so people, you know, if you want to share, people know, but also make it okay to talk about the workplace, right? Um, yeah. Don't make it feel weird. But also the, the networks, particularly for those entrepreneur networks that you see, um, making sure, and I guess it kind of gets back to role models and connections, seeing others, um, normalizing and creating access to, um, you know, creating access to a world that is not just kind of white cisgender, you know, males, you know, the classic VC picture that you have in your head. Um, thank you for that. And I, I also want to pivot a little bit, um, Shelby, to cybersecurity, um, which is, you know, a very specific section of tech. Um, and I would love to hear a little bit more about, you know, one, is this an area where women are underrepresented even in, you know, versus technology overall? Um, and what's the, what are the challenges that you, you have faced, women that you see have faced in that space um, in pursuing a, a career path in cybersecurity in particular? Yeah, I don't, um, so really, I don't have the exact statistics for you, Cecilia, about the the, the representation of, of the various core demographics within cyber. Um, but yes, women are underrepresented, and I would argue it's probably a little bit more so in this um, seg segment, sub segment of technology um, versus um, some others. 
So with regard to some challenges that I see, I mean, all the points that we've articulated before um, definitely still apply to this um, market segment within technology. Um, but what I found was interesting, so just to give you a little bit of, uh, of my background, when I joined Accenture, I basically joined straight into cyber, coming more from a functional bus business background. Um, and so I, what was challenging for me was fundamentally, I didn't, uh, look like any of the other cybersecurity professionals, uh, literally and figuratively. I, I was coming from it from a more of a, I have an international policy degree for crying out loud. So I'm thinking about it um, more about how do you roll out multinational programs, what do you know, multi, you know, nation state threat actors think a little bit differently versus your normal criminal threat actor, et cetera. So I definitely found myself having to, you um, be a little bit more verbose about the value of my skill set versus just a proper kind of development and engineering background. Um, and that being said, I think uh, for as a little bit of serendipity, I grew up in an all male household. So I was taught very early on that one has to be a, a quite intentional to, to be heard, um, if you will. So it, you know, blessing and a curse. I didn't notice some of these slights against me earlier on in my career. And it wasn't until I probably got it about three or four years. And I'm like, oh, I am actually having to work a little bit harder to be heard and my outcomes to be noticed, et cetera. And where this really changed was I started, to, I found senior leadership sponsors who valued the type of work that I did that knew that the functional component wrapper to any of our technical implementations were in fact value add and needed for our clients. So having that little bit of not only affirmation that I wasn't just thinking crazy because I was thinking different, um, but then also the corroboration from someone who was more senior that had the reputation so I could kind of uh, uh, benefit from their reputation. It just got, it allowed me to establish credibility. And once you start to get that credibility, it, it builds. Um, and so what I find for women is I, try to advocate that they find senior sponsors as soon as they possibly can and it may shift in, the, in their careers given what they're focusing on or their you know their portfolio etc but someone who can not only just provide you the general mentorship but the, that can help you provide just a little bit more credence to your point of view helps until you can firmly establish that uh yourself and i i love that um you have really articulated <laughs> moving into a uh oh sorry can you hear me Okay, good. Um, I love yeah, that no. you've articulated um, moving into a STEM field from a more of a liberal arts or a kind of political science type background. I, I was an English major, <laughs> the, the king of useless degrees, people say. Um, and so- Theater hey, major. They're all, oh, oh, well, I'm sorry. You really <laughs> useless degrees. <laughs> you win. Um, but, but I love the articulation of that because what it shows is the ability to think in the right way um, to and to be able to to be represented in the STEM sector post grad, you know, do you think that I, this is a question back to both of you? Do you think that um, you know would you advise young women and women in general? Hey, you can move into this if you haven't had all the experience in the world, the undergrad degree, the master's degree. Um, you know, you can find your way in if you think right and contribute right. I, I would love to hear your take on that message. Well, I can I can offer a take on that message because yeah. that, that I think that's absolutely the right way to enter a tech career is not to just come up as a coder, learn coding, do coding. Certainly as an entrepreneur, what you're looking for is a problem to solve. You're not looking to create a piece of technology. You're looking for a problem to solve. And um, I have a former student who started teaching a, a seminar on, on tech for non-techies, which is just enough technical knowledge so that you can actually work with developers to create yep. tech-enabled solutions to problems. And so I think that becoming tech literate at any point in your career is going to be beneficial because all business is tech-enabled now. Right. So you know we talk about the tech startups. Well, Uber, this big tech startup. Uber is actually a taxi service. It's a services right. business. It's a highly tech enabled services business, right? Amazon is a technology company in its AWS offering, but it's a 
commerce company in its, you know, commerce side. So, so everything's tech enabled. So becoming more tech savvy, no matter what point you're in in your career, and learning enough to say, how would tech apply to this business problem is going to certainly help any entrepreneur, but it's also going to help you as a business manager because tech is so much a part of business. Yeah, thank I you for that. Yeah, go ahead, Shelby. I was going to say, I completely agree with Waverly. And it kind of goes back to the point that I was mentioning earlier about tangential skills. So I've had to learn technology. You know, like I said, I come from more of an international business, international policy uh, background when I entered, uh, entered the firm in the field. Um, but I've always said that you have to know kind of plus or minus one or two of your your degrees of, of where you're, you're shipping because you have to be able to do the handoffs. So for me, working with technical teams and then working with my clients, I basically have to be the translator. I have to know what problem we're trying to solve for the client, whether it's, you know, you're trying to reduce costs of the security organization or, you know, defend against X, Y, Z new threat. And then be able to translate that to all of my fabulous developers and, and engineers. So I have to know enough about their, where they're playing in the market, whether it's, a, you know, an e-commerce business or oil and gas company, as well as um, know enough um, to be able to to speak with my my developers. So, I, you know, I don't want folks to to... Um, be scared of learning technology. I think Waverly was spot on. We at Accenture, we say every business is a tech business. It's just part of it. You don't necessarily need to know Python or C Sharp, et cetera, but how technology enables certain outcomes will be a really, really great skill um, to learn and kind of be dynamic with because it will change. Tech moves so fast these days. Exactly. It'll change. Exactly. <laughs> you have to learn it anyway, so you may as well get used to it. Um, okay, so closing question that we're going to pivot over to q and I want to talk to each of you about something in what you do that brings you purpose and excitement. Um, Shelby, we can go ahead and start with you and then we'll close with you, Waverly, and move to the questions. I've got two things. Um, one of the reasons why I stay in cyber, I've got a little bit of an altruistic heart. So I feel good about, you know, protecting, uh, you know, the critical, the electric, electrical grid of the, of the United States and several other uh, core market segments. But then also, um, I'm doing a bit of succession planning myself right now for various role shifts that I'll be doing. And as I'm putting, you know, names on paper, like these are women and other diverse talent that I've mentored for the last two years, and they are going to get to take over, you know, an offering that's going to get to generate revenue and help clients. And I'm, I'm just so pumped for them. And the fact that I got to be part of their journey and then give this opportunity for them, like, I, I know it just it it makes me all googly inside. I, I quite <laughs> enjoy it. <laughs> so on this particular subject of diversity, which is a passion of mine, I actually am working with entrepreneurs as they're building their corporate cultures. And by being able to make them aware of the advantages of diversity in business in the classroom, they become more intentional about how they build their businesses. I work with so many entrepreneurs who are very, very thoughtful about how they recruit, how they retain, the language they use around their branding, around their companies, around their hiring, because they want to create diverse teams. And, and it's, it's a part of their social mission in addition to their business mission. And I think that is incredible. And it's not just US students. I teach students all over the world. And so you have people who are working on a business degree at the top, one of the top business universities in the US who are working with female colleagues in a way that they don't work with female colleagues in their businesses or in their countries and are thinking about building different businesses and that's happening all over the world because of the work, the work that we're doing. And that, you know, that'll get you out of bed. Yeah, the, both of you are really seeding kind of the ways that people think about it in the future and, and the way you're you're developing either the entrepreneurship space or, you know, Accenture, right? And and kind of leadership in a company like that. That those are both very energizing. I can see, I can see why those are such passions. Um, okay, we've got some questions. So I'm going to go ahead and share. Um, I would love it if either one of you would just pick up what you kind of feel um, re you really connect to. The first question is, how do women push um, ourselves for that dream job when we do know it's in reach? And what is a good reach without getting dis discouraged? And I think really what I'm hearing here is 
you know, I don't want to get discouraged. I do want to stretch. How do I think about doing that? I'll, I'll start off. One thing that, that you have to understand about many, many things in life is that it's a numbers game, <laughs> right? We don't think that the first person that we meet that we like is, is the person that we're going to be with for the rest of our lives. It's a numbers game, right? So apply for that job. And if you don't get that job, apply for the next job, right? When you're doing a job search, it's a numbers game. So you, you can stretch we all do this sort of systematically when we apply for college, right? We have our backup school, but we have our, our reach schools. We can think about that in fundraising, in asking for promotions, in applying for jobs, that the bigger the pie, the number of opportunities you're going after, the more likely you are to, to get a good one. So don't, don't do things serial one by one. I'm going to all right, I, I need a new job. I'm going to apply for this one. I'm going to go through the whole process. I'm going to wait to see what happens. Then I'm going to apply for this one. I'm going to go through the whole process and get out there and look at a bunch of different things. Think of it like a numbers game. That's great. I go like ahead, that. Yeah. Another um, way to think about it is I'll use this analogy and I also find myself using this one a bunch too, is I find this kind of goes back to my Tiffany box syndrome up for career planning is I always say create a roadmap of where you're wanting to go or kind of a vision of where you're wanting to go. Like, let's say we're going from here to LA. No, you want to get to LA eventually in your career. But I don't need you to plan out every single 7-Eleven that you're going to. There's this like, for other reasons, need to like hyper manage or hyper control career progression is some of the best opportunities that I've ever gotten were ones that came out of the blue. And I was asked to do something like, okay, I guess we'll do that. I guess we'll do this. You're, you're gonna be there if I need it, right? <laughs> so these high support, high reward opportunities that sometimes just serendipitously come in your path will oftentimes be the ones that bear the most fruit, bear the most fruit. Sometimes, sometimes you just gotta turn your brain off of the, all the anxiety and just go for it. Um, I know that sounds like overly trite and potentially overly crass, but sometimes you just got to do the turn off the analysis paralysis and just go for it. Yeah, I think that that is uh, that resonates to me, too. Um, I, when I when I talk to people about career path and they ask me about my career, I I just say you you're assuming I had any sort of plan. <laughs> at all what i really I looked really at is, is this interesting is it going to grow my skill in some way like i had no kind of linear oh, i'm going to end up over here doing this thing um it really was about hey this is an interesting stretch um yeah. you know let, let's try it right and see what happens and your commentary is bringing something else to you and i heard this it might have been like yeah. a brene brown podcast or something like this but i heard some career advice once that said follow your curiosity uh, if it just tickles your curiosity that much, like that'll give you the fuel and the momentum to figure out what you don't know al already. So I've always, um, as part of this succession plan that I'm talking about, I was offered an opportunity. I was like, may not be 100% qualified for, but it seems intriguing. So that's what we're doing. I'm preparing accordingly. We're we're gonna we're gonna go see how it how it rolls, <laughs> and if not, we will uh, revert to uh, Plan B. <laughs> No, I, I love that though. Um, that that looking for your curiosity, um, being able to roll with it, being flexible, definitely resonates. Um, and good advice, I think, to anybody in, in seeking, you know, ways to find that path that aren't necessarily the ones that are obvious in front of you. Um, let's talk a little bit about the the fields of STEM and tech, you know, in particular. Um, you know, a lot of women feel when they hear those words, STEM and tech, and we've talked a lot about words and how language matters. Those are very loaded. They can feel, I think, intimidating or scary. Um, do you think that kind of language in, in these fields can really help? Um, or is word choice too superficial and it really is about, you know, moving the needle in the cultures themselves by promoting diversity, you know, creating networks, et cetera? Words matter. Um, one of the things that I, I work with a terrific uh, recruiter who, who does a lot of unusual roles for growth companies. And one of the, the things he does is he makes sure that the job descriptions and the requirements are written in ways that are more open and, and less closed, right? So it's not 
six years of C++ and Python, right? It, it, it's experience with development in a e-commerce environment, right? So it's more open. <clears throat> it matters how you present your company's brand, how you present the educational opportunity, how you present the job opportunity. Language matters, but language isn't enough, right? You have to back up language with thoughtfully recruiting in different places. If your college recruiters aren't going to any classically, you know, historically black universities and colleges, you're missing a lot of talent, right? Those are, those are very well high ranked schools creating a lot of talent and they should be in your recruitment pool. If you're not networking, joining the, the, the network of, you know, in the case we were talking about LGBTQ before, if you're not participating in, in start out as a, a VC, you're not seeing where the pipeline of LGBTQ entrepreneurs is going. So language matters, it's important. STEM itself shouldn't be scary. It's how we describe the job opportunity or the entrepreneurial opportunity around it. For example, health tech is one of the best places for women entrepreneurs. Women entrepreneurs are doing very, very well in health tech. So that's a STEM field that is very opening and welcoming to women and women are doing a lot of innovation there. So language matters, but it also has to go to policy. Thank you, Shelby, anything to add? It's interesting when I saw that question pop up in the in the chat, I, like, ah, I hadn't really thought about it from that perspective, but hearing we really speak, I just wanted to corroborate one of the points that she made about job descriptions. There is literally a piece of work that I'm working with and in healthcare insurer right now is they're having a struggle for war for talent, in which case we are helping them expand their talent pool. And one of the activities, one of the deliverables is rewriting all their job descriptions to make sure it's inclusive for tangential and non-traditional skills that can then be um, either directly um, immediately effective or reskilled into, into cyber. So as a bit of a, an underline and exclamation point to, to Waverly's comments. Thank you. And thank you both, first of all, for that. And then also just, I have enjoyed talking so much with both of you and getting your answers. And it's really got me thinking. Um, Bob, I see you. I would love to turn it over to you now. Um, so take it away. Thank you, Cecilia, Waverly, Shelby. Uh, thanks for a great discussion. Uh, there were just a, a number of things which I thought were super interesting that hopefully people will take away. Um, don't, you don't need to be perfect. Take stretch roles, find your version of being assertive. You need to hear no, you need to figure out how to be heard. Those are all things which I think are really practical advice. And I know it's always easier to say than it is to do, but, um, thank you all very much for the great discussion. Um, by the way, I am Bob Kress. I'm a managing director with Accenture, uh, also in the security business with Shelby, and a co-chair of the Executives Club Business Technology Forum, along with Mark. So thanks for being with us this evening. Let's begin with a big virtual round of applause uh, for the panelists. So Waverly Deutsch, Shelby Flora, and Cecilia to you as well for moderating the panel discussion tonight. It was great hearing uh, both of you and hearing the academic as well as the business perspectives uh, and how you're thinking about the future of technology talent and what we can do to broaden that talent pool and get it to be more diverse and more inclusive, certainly with women as well as other dimensions. So on behalf of uh, Mark, as well as the Executives Club. Thank you for all taking the time to tune in for tonight's program. Um, we hope you'll consider joining the Executive Club for another program this month on August 23rd. The Food and Beverage Forum uh, will host a discussion on food innovation through the lens of the current marketplace. It will be held in person at Baker McKenzie. And for more information and to register, uh, please visit uh, the executivesclub.org website. 
Again, thank you all for joining us this evening, and we look forward to joining us again soon. Take care and good evening.